2 Thessalonians. And we are doing the final verses of chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 2, verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. It really got tighter up here, didn't it, since I've been away, huh? Or did I gain weight? You're all not supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> um, just a minute. I'll probably still trip, but oh well. Christ is coming again. The Thessalonian church had heard. In fact, don't forget, and I, and I know that last week that Jeff read through the passage again in, in Acts 17, but don't forget that the Thessalonians only had three weeks with Paul. This is really kind of amazing. In three weeks' time, he teaches them, people accept Christ, and he leaves because they're persecuting him and trying to take his life. And so the brothers and sisters send him out of Thessalonica. They send him to Berea, which is really a cool place. It says the people of God to believe the word of God there is really neat. Except the Thessalonians don't like it. I should say some of the Jewish Thessalonians don't like it. Some of those who were persecuting Justin and Paul. So they go to Berea because it's not that far away. And now Paul gets taken away from Berea, and he will head to Athens, where he'll now have another jumping off place, right, to reach Asia, and eventually, through the divine sovereignty of God, he'll make it to Rome. There he'll minister to the Praetorian Guard, speaking to them every single day, night and day, 24 hours around the clock. He has opportunity to witness to them for Jesus Christ, and eventually many of them will accept Christ, and look, even the house of Caesar and it even says, Scripture says that the wife and the family, people of the house of Caesar come to know Christ. Why? Because Paul got to go to Rome to preach. He got to go there free. He, he didn't have to pay for it because <laughs> he was arrested <laughs> and locked up, chained night and day to Praetorian Guard. <laughs> they had to listen to him. So, I mean, God's, God is good, folks. God is good. Now, most of us would say, chain night and day. No, Jesus, please deliver me from this, right? Wouldn't most of you? Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, most of you, we, we would, oh, no, this is terrible. You know, I've been sent to prison, and I'm going to suffer here. And, you know, and, and you'd be, you know, all crying and whining and wanting to get out. And Paul said, yes. <laughs> yes, oh Lord, you have given me an opportunity I can't pass up. And that's what Paul does. So, but Paul with the Thessalonians only had three weeks with them. Now in that time, from this letter here, we understand that he actually wrote 1 Thessalonians because there was concern about the second coming of Christ and when it would come and what it would be like. So that means that in that three week period of time, he actually got to even talk about the second coming. He got into some interesting stuff. But you know, it doesn't surprise me that he got into the second coming because he said, when we eat the meal at the table of Christ, what are we supposed to do? Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, just kind of put that somewhere in your notes or back in the back of your burner where you'll remember that because that is a very important thing. What did Paul teach in three weeks? And really, my question I'd like to ask you is, if you had three weeks with some people, who didn't believe in Jesus Christ, who believed in all kinds of other gods, who had a total different morality than Christ, what would you teach them in three weeks? Only three weeks. And after which, a whole church would be formed. That's pretty cool. Whole church is formed. 
that's the sad thing is, is then the reason Paul's writing is because he has heard that somebody else has written a letter. It may have even been to somebody making prophecies or maybe a mixture of the two, it appears. Some kind of letter has come to Thessalonica and has told them, sorry guys, Jesus already came back. Because you see, here's the order of events. Jesus comes back, then tribulation, then the end. Oh, and by the way, church is taken before that. That's the order that they were being taught, at least by some people, right? So if you're in tribulation, if you're suffering, if you're in, under persecution, guess what? Thessalonians, you missed the boat. Jesus came back, he left, took the saints with him. You weren't a saint. That's why you're still here. Yeah. <laughs> so think about that. You're still here because you're obviously not good enough. Oh my goodness. And now they're pretty distraught about that. So Paul's trying to say, hold on everybody. I need to explain to you. Christ has not come back yet. How do we know that? And this is what you learned last week. We know that because the lawless one has not been revealed. What do you, which lawless one? There's all kinds of lawlessness out there. So how do I know which one's him? Well, he's going to do something if you want, somewhat unique. He's going to perform miracles. That's not the unique piece. Doing the miracles without the power of Jesus Christ, well, that's not the unique piece either. Putting a statue up in the temple area in his name and telling everyone to worship it, that's unique. And when that happens, folks, guess what? I think we might be near the end time. <laughs> it's pretty serious then. Now, here's the challenge. Is that what Paul understood is, is that people, as they're coming closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, and especially people who are facing persecution like the Thessalonians where they were dying folks, literally giving up their lives simply because they believed in Jesus Christ. It's happening around our world. Unfortunately, we're not quite seeing it because we have this buffer zone called the Pacific and, and Atlantic Oceans. Besides, we have this kind of this American buffer that makes us think, you know, we're safe. Right? Right? I mean, we're not near the Valley of Megiddo, so what do we have to worry about? You know, let, let it all happen over there. And that's kind of some of what happens to us. On the other hand, we can go the other way and we can get so worried about it, so stressed out about it that we put all of our focus there and we miss what Paul also is trying to say. See, that's what happened to the Thessalonians. Oh no, we've missed it. We're not going. Oh no, he already came. This is terrible. It's going to get worse. Oh no. And where do you get your focus? And what Paul is trying to say is stop everybody. Let's get our focus back on what really matters. And that focus we're going to say as we look at the text is Jesus Christ and doing the work of Jesus Christ. So he says, no, I'm sorry. Actually, it's good news. Christ has not returned yet. The lawless one has not set himself up in the temple. Incidentally, Revelation describes that, that statue that's going to be sitting there. It's going to actually speak and perform miracles. Whoa. Do you think we'll miss that one? I mean, maybe, maybe you can say, okay, well, I don't know. Is this Megiddo or not? Is this the big battle? Is, you know, is, are the events coming there right now or not? You know, you know, everyone's opposing Israel. Is that part of the process? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, with all this stuff coming together, it, 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 are we near the end times? Yeah. I can tell you this. We are 2,000 years closer to the end times than we were when Jesus was here. <laughs> fact. 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 Write it down. Quote it. I don't care. Fact, okay? We're definitely closer. Are we there? Who knows? Literally, who knows? God does. The Father God says he knows. Jesus himself says, I don't know. I don't know. That's up to, the, up to my dad. Father knows when it's time and when it's time. And in the meantime, chill out. The Holy Spirit's taking care of the Antichrist. Okay? The Spirit of God. He's the power in the world. He's the power in the church. He's the power in the people of God. He's taking care of the Antichrist. He'll deal with him also, Christ will, when he returns. So in, in both senses, chill a little. Okay, but then in, into our text. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved. God chose you. In fact, that's what Paul is saying here. He says, 
Thessalonians, I thank God that he chose you. Virgil, I did that just to wake you up. No, not really. <laughs> I, <laughs> Aaron, I thank God that he chose you. <laughs> Mick, I thank God that he chose you. Wendy, I thank God that he chose you. Virgil, I thank God that he chose you. Junior, thank you. I thank God that he chose you. See, this is what Paul is saying. He says, I'm looking back at the Thessalonians and I'm, and I'm seeing some of these faces and some of these people in my mind and all. And I'm like, oh, thank you, God. Thank you for choosing them. Oh, wow, they're so special. And he says, I also thank God that not only did you choose them, but that you saved them. You saved them by the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. See, the, here's, we're going to see, Spirit's power is really significant in all this in dealing with the second coming and dealing with the Antichrist in our work as we try to witness for Christ and as we try to live for Christ. The Holy Spirit is critical. Thank you for saving them with the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. Notice he didn't say, thank you for saving them by all the good things they did. Hmm? Thank you for saving them because of what a nice person they were. Thank you for saving them because of the way they drive their car. You're all in trouble. See, he doesn't go into any of that because nothing like that saves us. The only thing that saves us is the cleansing work, the sanctifying work is the word that's used there. The cleansing work of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that comes into us. It's the Holy Spirit that's remaking us. It's the Holy Spirit that's helping us to become like Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that's dwelling within us. It's the Holy Spirit that then empowers us with supernatural abilities to serve Jesus Christ and to live in a world that's fallen and getting worse. Yes. Yes, it is. And it's troubling. And frankly, it's at times heartbreaking to look around at the evil and anger and the hostilities and the stuff that's taking place, the sin that's all around. But, the, but he says, I'm thanking God. The Holy Spirit, and the power of the Holy Spirit is cleansing you. But not only that, I also thank God because you believed the word of God. You see, there's this cleansing power of the Holy Spirit, but there is kind of a response we have to make, don't we? Jesus died on the cross, true. He rose from the dead. He paid the price for the sin. But at some point, we have to say, yes, I'm going to open up the gift and accept it. And if you don't open up this gift and accept it, you can be a religious person. You can sit in church. You could be here at Crestline First Baptist Church for the rest of your life. But if you don't accept that gift, you don't have the cleansing. Salvation comes because of what Jesus Christ did, what the Holy Spirit does inside of us, and then we accept the gift. So he says, I'm thanking God for those of you who believed the word of God. And maybe that's a question for us today too. Do we believe the word of God? Well, I, yeah, I believe the good parts, but there's some parts I don't want to agree with. So the, that I'm not going to believe, right? Do, do we do some of that? We divide and choose what we're going to accept and what we're not. See, even some of what he's even saying is, I'm, a, I'm praising God because you believe the word of God. This is Paul. You believe the word that I preach to you. But Paul doesn't want it to be stuck on him. So he says, you believe the word that I preached to you, which was from God. You believed what God was trying to say. Folks, my prayer every time I come up here is not that you're listening to Bill, okay, but that you're going to listen to God. And I, in fact, pray that God will give you a message even if I don't. But the thing that I do know and I'm confident of, and that's why I can stand here and not be too afraid to come up here, is because the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's going to reach deep into the heart and the marrow of your own soul. It's yeah. the word of God that is God-breathed by that same spirit that we've already talked to. It's the word of God that's going to give you life if you will allow it to. It's not really dependent upon me, is it? Wow. And that's why he's saying, I'm thanking God that you did what? 
that you listened and believed the word of God. He goes on, he says, now, now because of this, he says, you, not only did you believe, not only were you cleansed, not only were you saved, not only were you chosen, which is all wonderful, but Jesus has not returned yet, so stand firm, folks. Have you heard that one before? Yeah. <laughs> A few times, huh? Stir, stand firm when you're in the battle by putting on the armor of God, the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, your loins girded with truth, the gospel of peace on your feet, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the, the word of God. Take up that armor of God and pray and pray for me and pray for one another and pray for boldness and hold on to the armor and stand firm, he says. Or he says, stand firm when you're anxious, when you're afraid, when you're nervous. Be strong and stand firm. When you hear the, the roaring lion and the little lion wants you to run and give up and, and be afraid, he says, stand firm. You see, we have heard that phrase before, haven't we? And it's, it's such an important thing because our temptation is to not be strong. It's to be weak. It's to give in. It's to fight. It's to, to do our own thing. And he says, no, don't give in to your normal humanness. He says, stand firm. And what else does he say there? He says, stand firm and, and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Do you remember me asking a question earlier in the message? What would you teach somebody in three weeks? That's what Paul says he wants them to hold on to. Stand firm and hold on. I gave you some jewels, some incredible insights, some wisdom that if you'll hang on to this, it's what's going to carry you through no matter what happens. These are three-week-old baby Christians, folks. Now, by this time of the writing of 2 Thessalonians, they're probably two or three years old, right? Uh, that's still kind of young, isn't it? How many of you are older than a two-year-old as a Christian? You've accepted Christ more than two years ago. More than two years ago. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I was beginning to wonder. I thought this you. you were. <laughs> so show those hands again. You're older than two years old. Okay, so guess what? You're very mature. Very mature. How many messages have you listened to? How many Bible studies have you heard? How many times have you, how much, how much scripture have you read? You are like a saint in the church. Amen? Amen. Well equipped, you have everything you need to go out and change your world. So guess what Paul said? He says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Woe is me if I do not the work, do not do the work of a preacher. How y'all doing, two-year-olds? And above? Not too good. <laughs> he says, look, hold to my teachings. Hold on to God. Stand firm. Use all the tools that, that the Holy Spirit's already given to you. And hold on to things you've been taught. Folks, some of you know so much, you're overknown. <laughs> okay? I mean, seriously, it, you're like my computer. And yes, I have an Apple, and I know Daryl has a PC, and that's his problem. But... <laughs> But, and I know that, but my apple's starting to slow down some. Yeah, my apple, of all things, it's still faster than Daryl's PC, but nevertheless, it, it, it's starting to slow down some. Guess why? Because it knows too much. I've got too much on it. I mean, I've got gigs and gigs and gigs of memory, right? But I've also got gigs and gigs and gigs of stuff I've been putting on there. And sometimes I may have 15 or so programs running at the same time, which Daryl's PC can't do. <laughs> Amen, Paul? <laughs> I don't think I've ever talked about Daryl's PC before, so I apologize, Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we're not going to have that discussion right now, Carol. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. We're not going to have that discussion. <laughs> Thank you. No, we're not going to do that either. <laughs> I apologize. Forgive us. Forgive me for taking you into sin. Okay. But, but here's the thing, right? What I'm trying to point out is, is that my computer has too much stuff on it. Some of us have too much stuff on it we're not make, putting to use. And God has given you his word. He's already taught you things. Folks, woe is you if you're not preaching what you've received. Don't be afraid of that word preaching either because the word is about kerygma. It's about proclaiming. It's about getting it out what you've experienced. Tell your story, friends. 
And let other people know what Jesus Christ has done in your life. That's not telling them, you have to do this, this, and this. You're a terrible person and change your ways. You know, you know, nobody likes anybody talking like that, right? But God's saying, look, I've taught you things. Share it. Share it. He says, I, I've given you, and in fact, uh, one translation, I forget which one it was, had the word traditions. Well, that was an interesting word. It's the same word that we use for teaching in most places, but in this one translation, it said, that, you know, make sure that you, pa- that you hold, hold to the traditions that I taught you. But I thought today, that's really appropriate, isn't it? What was the tradition we just did today? Communion. That's a tradition, right? Yeah. But it's a teaching, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it meant to be a visual object lesson to remind every single one of us that the only way we're going to heaven is because of what Jesus did with his body being broken and his blood being shed. And it's also an object lesson to tell us, now, talk about that, what Jesus did, until he comes back. Look at that. It's all right there, isn't it? And so this is a tradition. It's a teaching It's an object lesson. Take your object lessons, hold on to them, and share them with other people. And then I guess really um, my my summary and last couple pieces of the message would be this. May God strengthen you. That's what he's praying for for the church. He's praying that we would be strong. That, That you and I would be strong. We need to be praying that for our brothers and sisters who are in countries where they are dying for Jesus Christ, where they're going to prison, where they're being told they can't worship, where churches are being burned down, where where families uh, in the church are being killed or s- raped and all kinds of nasty stuff. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters around the world. It is happening. We've got to stop ignoring that fact. We need to be more burdened on their behalf. So, we, But we need to realize that God will strengthen us as God is strengthening them. It was Solzhenitsyn that said who had been in the Gulag Archipelago. He had been in the prison for 30 years. He had suffered all the nasty stuff. He had eaten off the floor of the, that prison cell that was cold. He was set there basically with nothing on when it was snowing outside. And also you can imagine what that cold, damp cell was like inside. And God protected him. And he said, it was harder for me to serve Jesus Christ when I came to the United States than it was in, the, in, in prison. Why? sometimes there's a persecution of wealth and prosperity and everything going much better than we admit to that gets in the way of us worshiping God. And so he says, God strengthen you. God strengthen you. God help you, Thessalonians, as you go through these times, as you go through heartache and difficulty. May God himself, and that's what he promised to do, didn't he? God has promised that he himself, when we are in the trial and we'll turn to him, God will strengthen, 1 Peter 5, God will strengthen, restore you and establish you. He'll give you what you need if you turn to him. So may God strengthen you folks in whatever you're facing this week. VBS workers, may God strengthen you when it gets warm and hot Wednesday night, okay? And humid, and you're tired, and you're impatient, and you're ready to bite off somebody's head. Then eat some gum or something else so that you don't, okay? But God strengthen you to serve well this week. And, and, and really, then what did he say? He also went on, he said, and don't be troubled. Jesus Christ is coming again. And when he comes again, there will be some pretty serious things happen. And it will get nasty in our world. But he says, don't be troubled. In fact, what he goes on to say is stay focused on the truth. Do you remember what Jesus said was the truth? He said he is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So when Paul says focus on the truth, what would be good for us to focus on? Jesus. So focus on Jesus. It's what Hebrews said. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Fix your eyes on him. Think about him. Put your, put your focus on him. When you're getting stressed out, when you're struggling, and you're being tempted, and folks, hey, Ethan, do you ever get tempted with sin? I said, do you ever get tempted with sin? Do you ever get tempted to do something wrong? Yeah? When you get tempted to do something wrong, guess what? 
focus on the truth. And the truth is what? Jesus. Thank you. The truth is Jesus. Because Ethan's not the only one who gets tempted to sin, huh? Will? Are you ever tempted? No, you're an Air, Air Force guy, right? You know how to obey everything, don't you? Are you ever tempted to sin? Focus on the truth. What's the truth? Jesus. And he says, it's the truth that's going to make you strong. It's God himself that's going to equip you. So folks, don't give up when the battle gets tough. Don't give in to it. Don't get discouraged. Don't let fear take over. Put your eyes back on Jesus Christ. And he will strengthen you and help you. Now, if you're struggling at that, guess what else you should do? Because what's, what do you think some of the other teachings are that Paul gave the, the, the church at Thessalonica? I think he taught them that loving one another was really, 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 really important. It was so important that they loved him so much in just three weeks' time that they pack him up and run him out of town so they can save his neck. They'll then come and visit him in Berea where he's again being attacked by some of their townspeople who are killing them and without fear of their own townsfolks, they're going to go to Berea and they're going to rescue him again. I think he taught them a tradition. And their tradition was what Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Look back at Acts chapter 2. If you look at Acts 2, after the Holy Spirit comes upon the church, what does it say that the church did that made them the church? What was their tradition that they developed? Well, guess what? They met in one another's homes. They broke bread together. What was that a reminder of? The two men on the road to Emmaus, when they sat down to break bread with Jesus, not recognizing who he was, as they break bread and they listen to him, suddenly their eyes are open because of the broken bread and the cup that he's blessed. And, it's the Messiah. He's alive. Their discouragement and their depression, the, the, the darkness is taken away, and they see Jesus sitting there. Because why? They broke the bread together. They did their tradition. Jesus' tradition was to teach about love, wasn't it? Folks, we got to work on it. We got to work on loving one another. How many of us could say we have eight or ten people in here that we really love? that we know well enough that if they were hurting, we would know what to do. That we care enough about them, that we spend the time with them, that we worship with them, we pray with them, we get into the word with them, we allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to work through us. And I know some of you are saying, yep, here he is, he's just about to talk about life groups. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. Forget life groups. What's your tradition for loving a group of 10 to 12 people in a personal, intimate kind of way that includes the word of God, that worships the Lord with them, that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit working through all of you, and you minister to each other, and you do that on a regular enough basis that when you, you know when somebody's up and when they're down. You know what's frustrating them and what's encouraging them. You know what they're celebrating, and so you can celebrate with them. You know when they're weeping and mourning, and you can weep and mourn with them, and it's real, and it's, you feel it as much as they do. What's your tradition to accomplish that? I don't care if it's life groups or not. What I care about is do we have the tradition? Do we have the practice? And the sad thing is, oh, and I missed a piece, didn't I? Because there's another practice, wasn't it? Because the early church, when they were breaking bread and they were living and following the word of God together and meeting in one another's homes and all, what does it say? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because see, there's a final practice, isn't there? The Thessalonians practiced preaching the good news. They practiced it. And see, that's the other piece. And, and, and can we ever call ourselves, can we really call ourselves a church of Jesus Christ if we're not practicing the good news? If we're not preaching it? You see, we have VBS this week. How many children are going to be at VBS on, on Monday? 
two, three. How many children are going to be at VBS on this week? Four, three, I counted you. Are you guys going to be at VBS? Ain't. <laughs> Bye, <laughs> Bella, <laughs> Isabella. <laughs> Guess you can't hear me. <laughs> okay, look, VBS is about children being here. Guess what? Do you know what God has decided to do? Can you believe this? He's decided that he is going to invite people to come to VBS. And guess how he's going to do that? Through you. Through you. So, do you think God wants kids here this week? I think he does. I, frankly, I am not prejudiced. We have the best VBS on the mountain. We do, okay? You, you ask Coley, she'll be at her third one this week. And you ask her after this week, which one was the best of the three? And, and I know what she's going to say because I know the team. I know the stuff. I know the material. I know the focus. I know the way we put stuff together. Come on, look how goofy this is, okay? I, I know what's going to happen. Okay, but are you going to do your part? There's kids around this community who need to be invited and God wants to invite them and he wants to do it through you. But it's not just vacation Bible school, is it? There's a world out there that will go to hell, folks, and that should hurt our hearts deeply. There are people that you know. And if you don't know people who don't know Christ, get to know them. Love them, care about them. Whether they say yes to Jesus or not, they're never going to say yes to Jesus if you don't care. So let's start by caring about a world that's lost and let's help them to get ready because Christ is coming back and I don't know when, but God does. Let's pray. Father God, we're getting ready for some special times and Lord, I just pray that we'll be faithful, that we'll trust you, that, that we'll believe that there is hope and joy and, and peace and encouragement in the midst of the worst of trials. And, and God, I know that some of these people in this room are already facing forms of the Antichrist at work in their life. Attack from darkness has already come. They've been abused in various kinds of ways, God, and wrong has been done to them. And yet, God, you want to give them strength and peace and encouragement and hope. And I pray for that. Holy Spirit, come. Come bless this morning. To anyone here, God, who doesn't know you but is interested and wants to, I pray that you would help them to say yes. Show yourself to them, God, and give them your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.